Invasive species. There's a lot of talk about invasive species being a bad thing, but what exactly is an invasive species? How did they get here? And why are they bad for the environment? Well, let's break it down. First, an invasive species is an organism, a living thing. It can be a plant, animal, fungi, or even a bacteria. But the organism itself isn't bad. What makes it invasive is that it is non-native and causes harm. What do I mean by non-native? Where a species evolved is called its native home. If it is brought over to another part of the globe and establishes itself in a new environment, it is non-native. It did not evolve in the place that it is invading. Non-native is not the same as invasive. The trifoliate orange is non-native to North America. It was planted here, but it doesn't spread and escape the original place it was planted. It doesn't harm the North American ecosystem. Therefore, it is non-native, but not invasive. An invasive species must be non-native and harm the ecosystem health. They can also harm human health and or the economy. To understand how an invasive species is harmful, let's take a look at a healthy ecosystem. In a healthy ecosystem, all the native species have evolved in the same area, finding a natural balance of the predator-prey food chain. Predators have adaptations to help them hunt prey, and prey have adaptations that help them hide from predators. In a balanced ecosystem, no one species has dominance because there are limiting factors keeping populations in check. Limiting factors can be the climate, food and water availability, shelter, competition, and predators. Let's take a look at an ecosystem you might find in the United States. Grass is the producer, meaning as a plant, it takes energy from the sun to make its own food. Consumers must eat things to get their energy. Grasshoppers are the primary consumer in this ecosystem. They eat the producer. Shrews eat the grasshoppers, making them secondary consumers. And then hawks eat the shrews making them tertiary consumers. Food availability and predators are the big limiting factors keeping populations in check. Let's take a look at how populations change over time. The shrews eat the grasshoppers and eventually have babies. As the number of shrews increases, the grasshopper population will decrease but the number of hawks increases because they have more food available to them. After several generations doubling their populations, there aren't enough grasshoppers for everyone, and shrews start dying out. As the shrew population decreases, the hawk population decreases, but this allows grasshopper populations to rebound, and the cycle begins again. The max population a species can reach in its habitat is called the carrying capacity. What happens if an invasive species is introduced to the ecosystem? Let's say it's an animal, a poisonous frog from South America. In South America, there is a snake that is immune to poison and eats the frog, keeping the population under control. But when the frog is accidentally released into the U.S. ecosystem, it has no predators. The frog starts eating up grasshoppers, outcompeting the native shrews, and the hawks can't eat it because it's poisonous. Let's take a look at how the populations change now that an invasive species was introduced. The frog eats all the grasshoppers, leaving no food for the shrews. When the shrew population decreases, the hawk population decreases, and the ecosystem has been devastated by this invasive species. There are many real-world examples of this happening. The Burmese python, native to Southeast Asia, was released into the Florida Everglades in the 1970s by irresponsible pet owners. There, it has no natural predators. It can even eat alligators. 
As the python numbers grew, they outcompeted natural predators in the ecosystem. Zebra mussels from Eastern Europe were accidentally brought over to the Great Lakes by boats in the 1980s, and they rapidly spread outcompeting native fish populations for their food, phytoplankton. These mussels also have a significant effect on the economy, damaging water structures and ruining beaches. In the 1870s, the kudzu vine, native to Japan, was planted in Southern America as porch decoration. The warm temperature and no natural predators caused the plant to spread rapidly, swallowing up entire meadows. These are just a few examples in the US, but you can see the effects of invasive species all across the globe. But how do these invasive species get to different places? Most often, it is because humans, either intentionally or unintentionally, brought the species to a new place during travel. Marine crustaceans and plants can attach to boats and transfer between bodies of water if boats aren't cleaned. Insect larvae can be unintentionally brought through travel of goods like wood. Other invasive species were purposely introduced or released in an area, but then their populations became out of hand. Let's look at Clay Pit Pond State Park on Staten Island. Here we have an ecosystem devastated by invasive plants such as Japanese stiltgrass and Japanese barberry. These plants have been helped by the overpopulation of a native species, the white-tailed deer. Hundreds of years ago, the New York area was covered in old growth forests. Tall trees created a thick canopy cover, limiting the amount of undergrowth. Deer lived on the edges of the old growth forest, unable to reach the food high up in the trees. Additionally, predators like mountain lions and wolves kept the populations in check. When European settlers arrived, they deforested much of the eastern U.S. So today, there are young forests with thick undergrowth. Deers thrive in this thick undergrowth as it provides shelter and easy access to food. The suburbs sprang up, pushing out large predators and making the perfect habitat for a boom in deer population. Deers arrived on Staten Island and took over, eating up native plants and tree saplings. As the deer population grew, the native plants decreased. In their place, invasive species have established themselves all across the island. Japanese stiltgrass covers the forests at clay pit ponds. The stiltgrass has no predators as the deers don't eat it. Plus, this plant species can spread rapidly and their seeds can be viable in the soil for up to five years. This harms the ecosystem because migratory birds have much less space to build nests and important berry and seed resources are gone. These invasive plants also harm human health because they provide the perfect place for ticks and rodents carrying Lyme disease to hide. Now we know what an invasive species is, but what can we possibly do about them? We can do three things. prevention removal, and native restoration. The best way to stop invasives is prevention in the first place. We must promote laws that inspect foreign travel of plants and animals to ensure invasive species aren't hitching a ride. Make sure to always clean your boat before taking it to different bodies of water. When camping, don't transfer firewood between parks to prevent the potential spread of invasive insects. Don't release exotic pets. Pets like the red-eared slider will take over a pond out competing native turtles. Report sightings of invasive insects like the Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, and spotted lanternfly. Foresters will remove trees that have been infected. You can report invasive sightings to community science projects like New York's IMAP Invasives. Volunteer at local removal projects. Look out for when Clay Pit has invasive removal days. Support controlling deer populations. 
Even though they are native, the overgrazing from overpopulation can make room for invasive species. And plant native plants! Making a native pollinator garden helps attract native bees and butterflies. Try planting native bushes for migratory birds. And don't forget to tell your friends what you've learned about invasive species. You can check out New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation website for more information about invasive species in New York. Thanks for watching!